Hello world, it's Craig. I've received back my Nibbler workalike boards from the Fab House. So here's the Nibbler board. This is the 8K RAM board. And then I made a little backplane that I can use to connect them. Now I've built up the Nibbler board itself and I have it going, but there were a couple of minor issues along the way. And this video is gonna cover those issues if you decide to build one of these version 0.9 boards. And this video also includes the baud rate change and fixing that bit seven gecko bug that I mentioned in an earlier video. So the Retro Chip Tester Pro made it easy to download the contents of the original Nibbler ROMs, download it, put it into a little memory card, and then upload it into a pair of EEPROMs. So when I originally did this, I had the configuration, everything set up exactly the same way that I was running the original Nibbler board. So I had it run at 110 baud. I was using my edge port connector. I had my handy little uh, serial adapter. I finally found that. It was just exactly where I left it. And I got everything working, or got everything at least set up to, to run at the 110 baud. And that's when I found a couple of mistakes in this reproduction board. The first one is there's a silk screen error on these two resistors by the crystal. And so I had those two resistors swapped. And so rather than running at four megahertz, this thing was had about a 12 megahertz clock going into it. And nothing was working, of course, but the SEMP was you know, trying its darndest to keep up. So once I swapped those two resistors back, then I got my, four, my correct four megahertz clock. The board immediately fired up and it sent out its prompt correctly. Unfortunately, it was not understanding any input from the terminal. So it was sending out the prompt correctly, but when I typed anything, it, it thought it was garbage. But anyway, after a little bit of digging around, I found out that there's a difference between the Nibbler hardware itself and DigiKey's documentation for this. And they've got the positive and negative inputs for the serial line swapped around on the fingers compared to the documentation. And my board matched the documentation in the pinout table but of course theirs didn't. Put my board in it, I connected it up for my board, but it was uh, creating a problem because the signals were backwards on this. And this was just getting a, the serial stream was inverted and it wasn't understanding that obviously. So I should note that DigiKey corrected that table in their, their documentation for the 8K RAM board. So if we look at the, the table listing for this, it has this pin six and eight swapped from the original Nibbler documentation. But since I used the original table values on my Nibbler and for you know the silk screen like on the back plane and everything, I have the pin out here. Now I'm kind of torn as to whether I should change everything in my design to match the original Nibbler or if I should just kind of create a new standard and leave those pins the way they are. So, you know, let me know your thoughts on that when I'm doing the next layout or when I make any more layouts, do I swap those pins or not? I mean, I have more hardware now than I think exists anywhere else. So maybe I should just set the new standard. Anyway, with those details sorted out, I got the board up and running at 110 baud with that original Nibbler firmware. I was using real term with the bit seven suppressed because of that, that bit seven bug in the nibble ROMs. So the next task on this was to bump the baud rate up. I wanted at least 1200 baud and ideally 2400 baud if the delay values were not unacceptably small. I mentioned in an earlier video that there were hand corrections in the nibble list file in Gordon's documentation and I suspected that Gordon had made them, but a commenter reminded me that somewhere else in the manual, it was noted that they were going to mark the, the delay change values for the two SCMP clock frequencies, if you're using the one megahertz version or the, the SCAMP2. So that's what those corrections actually were. They weren't from Gordon at all, but having those already called out made the switch to 2400 baud much easier since all the affected delay values were already circled. All I had to go back and, and you know, recalculate those values. So I calculated the values to get close, but I didn't actually add in the overhead delay from each loop. It was easier to just calculate them, put them in the ROM, and then put the logic analyzer on it and look at the waveforms and tweak it afterwards. So after I just empirically tuned in the values, the values were all reasonably large to make the, uh, the error 
in that bit delay time acceptable. And I've been running this at 2400 baud, and it seems happy enough to run at 2400 baud. So now once I was at 2400 baud, then I didn't need to use my edge port adapter anymore, and I could switch over and use my serial adapter that comes out the top. And that's when I discovered the third error on this board. Now, unfortunately, I forgot to double check the pinout of my USB to TTL serial adapter, and I connected the transmit and receive backwards on these. So until the next version of this board comes along, there's three ways to correct for that. You can either cut and patch the traces for pins four and five on the back of the board and swap them here, or you can take your connector out, take the wires out and swap them there, or instead of using jumpers down here, you can use a little uh, wire wrap and just kind of patch them over. Because the jumpers were supposed to just go straight on, but now we've got to go from this little pat, from this little jumper block over to this little jumper block. So on this one, obviously I just used the wire wrap. So with that done, now this board is powered just from the USB, standalone, it doesn't need anything else, and it's running just fine at 2400 baud. So the last thing I needed to do on this was come back and look at that bit seven bug in the gecko routine. So from a, a video or two ago, you may remember that when the input character is being echoed back to the terminal, bit seven of that echo character is always set. And at the time I thought maybe it was just a simple loop counting problem, but actually it is setting the bit properly. It just isn't delaying the full bit period once that bit is set. So if we look at the code, it's the normal bit banging that we all know and love. First, a bit counter of eight is configured because we're sending out eight bits in, in the character. Then the code loops while waiting for the start bit. When it gets and then verifies the start bit, the code delays for half a bit time before echoing the start bit back to the terminal. Now with that half bit delay, the code is now in the middle of the incoming start bit. And the code now goes into this loop where it's going to receive each bit. The first thing it does in this loop is it waits one full bit time. When we entered this loop, it was in the middle of the start bit. So after one bit period delay, now it's in the middle of the least significant bit. The next time through, it's gonna be in the middle of bit one and so forth. Now, as it goes through this loop, each time the input state of sense B is sampled, and then the loop tacks either a zero or a one onto the end of that incoming character. The loop then echoes that value to the output. And then finally, the last step in the loop is to decrement the bit counter. After it decrements it, now it tests the counter. And if there's more bits to receive, it loops back into the one bit delay. So the next time it's sampling from the middle of the next data bit. But if the count is zero, it means that all the bits have been received and tacked onto the incoming character and echoed. So it falls through that test and sends out the stop bit. So that's the bug, if you see it. The loop saved and echoed the last bit, bit seven properly, and then it decremented the counter to zero, but the bit delay is at the beginning of the loop, and bit seven isn't going to go through that loop anymore and get its delay. So rather than the delay, it falls out of this loop and continues with the stop bit. Bit seven was echoed to the terminal properly, but only for the time it takes to test this counter and set the output as the stop bit. So there was a bit seven, but it only lasted a few microseconds and it was replaced by the stop bit, which is always high. So now the task was to rewrite this code so bit seven gets its full bit period, but without increasing the number of bytes in this gecko routine, because if anything moves in memory, then everything in nibble is gonna be broken. And I could have tried to rewrite it from scratch and put the bit delay before the counter decrement, so at the bottom of that loop, but I thought first, well, maybe there are four underutilized bytes of code that I could just take out so I can then just put in another delay just for bit seven after the decrement and test. And I was actually able to solve this a number of different ways, or at least three different ways that I solved this, but the simplest way was to remove the waste code and add that dedicated bit seven delay here at the bottom. First, let's look to see where that code is wasteful. Here at 0F98, they, they read the bit from the input and it's tested to see if it's a zero or a one. To do that test, it's logically anded with two zero because the incoming bit is in bit five and two zero has 
a one in bit five, so all of the other bits are going to be cleared and ignored. But we need that bit that when we're going to set it and tack it on to our running total for the character, we need that bit to be on the end so that we can move it into the link and tack it onto that character. So rather than rotating the incoming bit all the way to the end, the program explicitly sets a temporary value to zero or one to match that incoming bit. If the result of that logical AND with 20 was zero, it means the incoming character bit is zero, and the program jumps ahead to a section where the temporary byte is set to zero, and then the code jumps down to where that temporary byte is saved into memory. Otherwise, if the AND with the 20 was not zero, then the bit sets the temporary byte to one, and then it jumps down to that same label where the temporary byte is saved, if it's a zero or if it's a one. But this is all wasted code, since if the bit was zero after the test, there's no need to jump away and load a temporary byte as zero, because if the jump, if zero was true, then the accumulator is already zero. And there's no need to create that temporary byte to save. Just, just jump down to that save label and save the accumulator as zero. And if the incoming bit were not zero, then the jump falls through, a one can be loaded, and then the program can just continue into that, save, that, that same save instruction. So taking out these needless jumps saves six bytes and gives us room to insert the needed bit delay after the loop test falls through on bit seven. So down here, I load the accumulator with a delay value. That's two bytes. Then the delay instruction, that's another two bytes. And then I had to put in two no-op instructions as fillers so that all the other addresses in Nibble are back to where they were before. Now, once that was done, there was a little bit of tweaking to the delay values because the loop in this new code had a little less overhead than in the original code. So I put it back on the logic analyzer and, and tweaked those values. I had to change it by a value of, of F, I think. Then just as I was patting myself on the, the back for a job well done, then I started searching around to see how others fixed the bit seven problem. I didn't mind doing it on my, my, my own to begin with because I learned a lot about this SCMP code while I was trying to fix that. And I never actually did find out how others fixed the problem, but what I did find was that the program listing for Nationals kit bug, which is the resident monitor on their SCMP engineering platform, it, it shares a lot of code with Nibble, and I knew that already. I knew it shared the code. But in kit bug, they had already found and removed all of this wasteful code. And as it turns out, they were using the exact code that I had just congratulated myself about figuring it out on my own. So, you know, there's nothing new in this. But it made me realize that I was fortunate because the ROM version of Nibble had those six bytes of wasted code that I could just remove and put in that special delay just for bit seven. But Kitbug has the same bit seven bug in the Gecko routine, but it doesn't have those extra, you know, those surplus bytes that can just be taken out. So I don't know how the Kitbug folks fix this bit seven bug. I presume they kind of rewrote this and moved the bit period delay from the top down to the bottom of the loop so that all bits use that same delay. But I expect, you know, maybe Retrofill or somebody else in the SCMP guru group can chime in and tell us how they got rid of that bit seven bug in kit bug. So anyway, with the bit seven bug fixed, that was the last of the challenges to get everything working the way I wanted it to work on this board. Now this board seems to be working okay, but other than originally using that serial port where pin six and eight were backwards down here, I haven't used any of the other fingers. So I may find more problems on this board when I'm trying to get my 8K RAM board and my backplane up and going. Or there could just be some mistake on the board layout or design that I, I just haven't found yet because I haven't fully utilized it. But it does seem to be working in its basic form. I have posted the build files and the ROM hex files for this 0.9 board on the project page. Now the ROM files aren't gonna change with the next version, but the board is gonna change as I fix these little things on this board that I didn't like. Another thing I didn't like is these jumpers and this original nibble jumper over here, you have to be careful or you can build up some contention here between signals. So I'm also kind of thinking about changing these jumpers so that it eliminates any potential for, for contention if your jumpers are set wrong. But I've posted those build files, and if you want, you can go ahead and, you know, I would hope that those interested will download the build files 
submit to their board fab shop, and then distribute the boards locally. Especially with you know all of the buffoonery going on at the moment with these nonsense tariffs. You know I'm not buying any boards to sell in my attendee store because I'm just not paying the the, the tariffs. But as usual, I am giving away these extra boards for those that are willing to pay for the shipping and promise to report back any problems that they find with the board or documentation. However, I'm no longer shipping these out of the country because, you know, we don't know how much these boards are going to cost when they arrive at somebody's house. So it's the normal process. Leave a comment to claim your place in the queue and then email me with your contact information and we can arrange to get a board to you. So I'll be back when I have, you know, at least one of these other boards going or if I have the next version of this board ready. But in the meantime, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.